Hi everyone, it's so good to have you joining us for another edition of my sailing podcast. I hope wherever you are on the planet, you're doing okay. And if sailing's your thing, you're managing to get some time out on the water. Here in Cowes, in the absence of being able to travel much, sailing seems to be more popular than ever. Every day, the Solent has been great. I've even been out there racing myself quite a bit, which has been wonderful. Before we get rolling, I must say a big thank you to all the listeners who got in touch about last month's pod. It was a bit of an epic, six gold medalists, all with really unique, inspiring stories. I hope in some way it helped fill the void in absence of any Olympic action this summer. We love to hear from you. So if you enjoy what you're hearing, please give us a like, leave a review, send me a message and just generally, well, spread the word. This month's podcast is a real corker. If you've even a passing interest in the America's Cup, I guarantee you're going to love it. It's a real no-holds-barred chat with one of modern-day yacht racing's big names. I'd go as far as to say he's America's Cup royalty and is currently in the final run-in to his 11th America's Cup challenge. He's won the cup four times. He was the navigator on board Australia 2, the team that broke the longest winning streak in world sport. The Aussie team that finally stole the trophy away from Dennis Connor and the New York Yacht Club after it had been in the US for 132 years. He's been the design coordinator and CEO of some of the biggest teams in modern cup history and is still very much at the sharp end of it all. I am, of course, talking about Aussie Cup legend Grant Simmer. He's now CEO of the British Challenge, Ineos Team UK, and was very generous with his time. This edition is a real glimpse inside the normally tightly closed doors of the America's Cup world. We talked to Grant at the Ineos Team HQ just as they were in their final pack-up before decamping for Auckland. I hope you enjoy the time I spent with Grant Simmer. I remember listening to the 1980 America's Cup on a transistor radio. That was the first time they could lost the cup, ever. Everybody was just shocked by the magnitude of what we'd done. Well, thanks for joining us, Grant. It's so good to have you on the podcast. We're with you here at the Ineos Team UK base in Portsmouth. There's not quite the normal vibe. There's no sailing, no action out on the apron. And below us in the workshop, boat number two, Britannia 2 being fitted out before her trip to Auckland. It must all be beginning to feel quite real and I guess pretty imminent. Yeah, well, thanks, Shirley. Thanks for inviting me. Yeah, the new boat's down there and it's pretty cool, actually. It's a really cool boat. Radical. Far more radical than I, it feels natural to me. I'm too conservative, but uh, we're in this weird class of boat and it's essentially a new thing and it's, so you've got to take a lot of risk. And so managing risk is a big part of this and uh, so it's exciting, yeah. And we won't sail this boat till we get to New Zealand planning to sail at mid-October, which will be a big day. Yeah, it's not long to go. No. We'll get onto all of that a little bit later. But, you know, it's been a windy summer here in the UK, Grant, and you've still found time to get out on the water. You still love to get out there and and really get amongst it. You sail the etchels with our good friend, Andrew Palfrey, dog, of course, and you still very much love to to get out there and and to compete at at a high level. Yeah, we did a regatta on Sunday, the one and only regatta of this COVID year, you know. And we sailed actually quite well, except we were in a protest in the third race and lost the protest. Port and starboard of all things, you know, very poor risk management. But it didn't really matter. But we just were glad to be on the water and sailing. 
Good little fleet, 12 boats, so a bit of fun. You've still got the fun. Sailing with dog, yeah. bossing me around. Like <laughs> you don't, you're not allowed to do anything except what he tells you to do, as you know. Well, we spoke to Dog, and yeah. the first thing he said was that we should ask you about boat speed. Listeners, I've sailed with Dog in his etchels just the once, and I admit it was windy. And if you don't know Dog, he's our sports super coach. He's all about analysis. And he was keen for me to remind you that you're currently holding the boat's second fastest top speed, 0.9 knots slower than the boat's fastest recorded speed. Helmed by my good self, of course. Yeah, he's told me that many times. <laughs> we went out last Saturday, which was really windy, and uh, failed again to beat your record. The bar's yeah. high. Yeah, yeah <laughs> of course. <laughs> okay, Grant, we're now in the final run into your 11th Cup campaign. So we've got much to chat about. But let's go back a little further. Growing up sailing on Sydney Harbour and looking at the names of your contemporaries, it was an impressive hotbed of talent. Did you have any realisation at the time that you were all part of a, a growing pool of very talented sailors? Um, no, 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 the answer is no. And uh, I really only competed in Australia, never went to New Zealand, did a regatta only once. So I was really just sailing in Australia in a string of classes like most of us do as we grow up. But we just had a good group of guys, you know, battling it out with the likes of Ian Murray. I used to, you know, used to really love that. And we're still mates all these years down the track, which is good. Still battling out. Yeah, 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 yeah. We sailed together in a natural world and finished a miserable, miserable result. And then he replaced me with Colin Bishop in the next World Championship and won easily, you know. So and that's not lost on many people. Yeah. Your father was an engineer, and I think I'm right in saying an inventor of, of boat components, working away in his workshop. How much did he instill in you a, a curiosity of how things worked? A lot, really, because he would make special fittings. He's, he was quite, he worked a bit with Benny Lexon actually, making winches and custom fittings for Benny. And uh, so he made, my boats always had some really nice little fittings on. And as I got older, we'd sort of collaborate quite a bit in figuring out different fittings. And he had a big machine shop so he could make, you know, not big, but a reasonable machine shop. So he could make most things and so we always had really nice boats and, uh, and he kind of instilled that in me. You weren't afraid to, to change things and make things? And... No, I, I never really sailed 18 footers, only the odd days. But that we're in an era with, you know, the likes of, well, Ian Murray was famous, but Coco and several others, and they would just experiment with their boats all the time. And now if you look at boat, like Ian's etchels now, he's always, there's just little ideas everywhere on the boat, just doing little things better all the time. And sailing's a lot about that, isn't it? Innovating and looking at every little detail, how you can do it better. Um, Dennis Connor was a great one for always improving every small detail on the boat. And... Um, I don't know, Bart Simpson is another one that I, you get stuck with in, in his day, poor old Bart, you get stuck with him and all he's talking about is little details on the boat, little things that they, he in purse could do better in everything on the boat. And that's, that's part of the sport and it's part that we really love, you know, just doing every little thing a little bit better. Yeah. You qualified as an engineer. So how did you then get into the whole big boat sailing? So, yeah, this is going back a long, long way. So I graduated from engineering. I ended up um, working as a consulting engineer, building a power station at a uranium mine in the Northern Territory. I was the second engineer on the job up there, quite, quite junior. And I, so I had to start. I wasn't sailing. I couldn't really sail. And um, 
I was building this thing. I remember listening to the 1980 America's Cup on a transistor radio, you know, like with the knob on the front, you tune it in. Anyway, so I listened to the 1980 America's Cup thinking that they, you know, thinking things they could have done better. And then lo and behold, within a year or so, Bertrand rings me, who I'd never met, John Bertrand, rings me and says, um, we're doing an Admiral's Cup boat for Alan Bond and would you consider getting involved in that program and come and work on the boat and we're going to start collecting sailing data in those days that was unheard of and different forms of instruments and things. And, um, and I thought, oh, yeah, I'll do that. <laughs> so we came and raced the Admiral's Cup and then that led into us going to Perth and um, building Australia 2, which they were building at Steve Ward's yard. And um, Bondi gave me a job in a brickworks, where another engineering job, putting a, a gas-fired kiln into a brickworks. So that was my day job. And then at, at, on the weekends, they were, we'd work on Australia 2, um, doing stuff in the yard with, with Wardy's yard. And eventually the boat, eventually the brick kiln was built. And secondly, the boat was finished and we went sailing. And then, you know, that led to going to Newport and suddenly sailing big boats are not dinghies anymore. And it really only happened because of a phone call from John. Watching the footage from 83, you get the impression Bondi had, had a great energy. You know, why did he invest his millions in trying to deliver what at that stage it must have still seemed impossible? I mean, just a reminder, the New York Yacht Club had held the cup for 132 years by then. They'd endured 24 challenges and Bond had won just one race out of 13 in his previous three campaigns. Why was he so determined and what was he like, Alan Bond? <laughs> Wow, that's a big question. So he started in 74, right? The first thing that he, and he was young, like he was in his 30s, building an, building an America's Cup boat with Benny Lexon, a, you know, kind of a left field designer. And Bondi was a risk taker and a bit of a rogue. And, uh, but he just, he wouldn't take no for an answer, really. He just had this incredible energy about everything he did. And sure, he was doing it to give himself credibility and notoriety, and he, he had business reasons to do it, but he was passionate about it as well. Um, and, and he backed Benny, backed Benny all the way, you know. And Benny was loose, you know, brilliant but loose. Um, and it was just such a great, and Warren Jones is a guy you don't hear much about anymore, was our team manager. He was a brilliant, brilliant manager and a brilliant guy. And um, so he dealt with all those issues with the New York Yacht Club and protests and political positioning and it was all going on. And we we were just kind of, sailing the boat every day, you know, almost oblivious to all that stuff. Uh, you know, Bertram was involved in it, but the rest of the crew was somewhat insulated. Anyway, Bondi, to answer your question, I know he was a rogue and he did a lot of things in business that, you know, well, he ended up in jail and rightly so, but uh, he was good to us and, uh, and his, it would never happen without his enthusiasm and his commitment. A lot of money, uh, you know, a lot of money in those days. But, uh, yeah, absolute character. And they used to, you know, he'd give speeches to the crew about motivation. He thought he was really good at that. And you could see Warren and Chink and the more senior guys would be there rolling their eyes. It was really you know, quite funny. We are all nodding politely. How exciting a time was it building up to that 83 Cup? I mean, a, a team of of young Aussie talent. I mean, did it feel like this time you might actually have a chance? 
for me, it was my first cup, and I was young, and I wasn't overawed by it, um, but I was just really, really focused on the one job, and and uh, you know, develop you develop confidence. We we raced a lot against the challenges in those years, and we won won a lot of races. So we got used to winning, and then when the cup started. We had a couple of breakages and we lost a couple of races early on. So we were a bit on the back foot and we, that was we were a little off our game, I thought, in the cup. And then, but we kind of got stronger towards the end, which obviously ended up with a good result. <laughs> Changed a lot of things to, for a lot of people and for the sport. Good thing for the sport, I think. Yeah, definitely. I mean, to win the cup, I mean, you always need a, a fast boat. And as you say, Alan Bond put his faith in the rather unconventional designer, Ben Lexon. What do you remember of him? And I mean, you, you've worked, worked with a lot of designers now. You know, how ahead of his time was he? Did you feel like you had something special? Um, yes. I actually, when, when we were here doing the Admiral's Cup, I went over to Holland and I had a look at the tank testing, which Benny was really nervous about because it was really top secret. And uh, he was over there tank testing his big tank with, you know, big models. In those days, they were really big models. Um, and he was really excited about it, Benny, really excited. And then we launched this boat. We launched two of them, actually, because he built... Challenge 12, which was a really good boat too, but much more conventional. And then Australia too, so we could race the two of them. And we did some regattas. We went over and we raced in um, Williamstown, it, uh, just just on the edge of Melbourne. And, we do, and it wasn't that clear what was the fastest boat. We, we were a bit nervous, to be, again, nervous to be radical, but... Um, Ultimately, we decided we had a deal with the Victorians. We could swap boats with them, um, but we went with Australia too, and thank God we did because it just got stronger and stronger during the summer. And Benny, Benny had done everything in those days. He did, you know, he did designed all the systems on the boat, designed the rig. Every fitting on the rig was massively smaller than everybody else's <laughs> fittings, you know. Everything, every detail he'd really thought about. And of course we had Schnack doing the sails, so we really had cutting edge sails with Schnack. Mm. Why did Bondi trust him so much? Oh, he just loved him, loved him like a brother. Yeah. And Bondi, I mean, Benny had done a, sh you know, Southern Cross was a sort of a shitty boat, but the Strader was a really good boat. And then he did that Bendy rig in 1980, um, it was John Oatley, Oakley, the, the English guy had done a bendy rig so he could get a bigger girth mainsail. And so Ben saw this and thought, we've got to do it. So he built a mast like that, which they raced in against freedom. And the boat was in light conditions a lot faster than the Americans because of that. Uh, but anyway, it panned out there only one, one race, yeah. When you got to Newport, there was the brilliant idea of, of skirting the keel, hiding Lexon's radical design. Whose idea was that and how much did it wind up the Americans? We skirted that boat from the beginning in Fremantle. We skirted it in, in, when we were in Williamstown as well. And we painted it, um, we painted it in, in Melbourne before we shipped it. We painted this sort of blue on the keel, I don't know if you remember. So it kind of would look more conventional. It was very hokey in those days, but anyway, that's what we did. So we thought we'd camouflage it so they couldn't see if they looked down from a helicopter or something. Uh, but yeah, we skirted and that just wound them all up, you know, even more. I'm sure they kind of knew we had winglets, but it was to do with the reverse, you know, the re reverse rake of the keel and the and the winglets together worked together, so the boat could, you know, had a low centre of gravity, really low centre of gravity, had good riding moment, so we could have a lot of sail area and a shorter, less powerful hull. 
That's great psychology, isn't yeah. it? Brilliant. That's good. I mean, you won the Challenger Series easily. And yeah. Dennis yeah. Connor, as the onlooking defender, he must have been rattled. I mean, how did they react? Um, well, they did all... There was a couple of... God, it's hard to remember. But um, he was in certain conditions that were OK, but we are a lot quicker on the square. We are a lot quicker running, for starters, and a lot quicker in light winds. When it was windier, they were just same speed up wind, really. But we're always faster downwind. And in those days, it was a triangular course. So it was a triangle, then a windward lure, then a beat to the finish. 5.4 miles each, you know, the windward leg. It was a long way. It took forever, the races. Um, but so they were pretty, it was once we started doing some light air races, we we're quite a lot faster than them. So they, before the last race, they reconfigured their boat, which was a kind of a glitch in the rule that they could change their certificate. So they made the boat shorter and put more sail area on it. Um, made a boat lighter and more sail area. So they reconfigured the boat before the last race, which was kind of controversial. Um, and they were quite quick in the last race compared to us, particularly upwind. So the last race ended up being close, as you know. I mean, how nerve-wracking was that, going out with one last race to achieve the impossible? Well, we th it was interesting because of two races previously, we could have lost the cup. So we had to win the last two races. And then, you know, because it was 3-1, so we got it to 3-all. So we were kind of used to losing. And then I figured race seven, there would have been some stress on, on their boat because that was the first time they could have lost the cup ever, you know, that day. So Dennis was Dennis and Tom were under some serious wick. I mean, that final race, it didn't look good on board Australia too. You were trailing for most of it. Talk us through the final two legs. Describe for us what it was actually like on board as things unfolded. Surely you're talking about something that happened nearly 40 years ago. But anyway, the t I'll tell you what I can remember. They jived at the top mark. They were ahead of us, uh, I don't know how much, like, but a good lead, 40 to 50 seconds ahead. They jived and we thought the pressure, well, we firstly we thought the shift was going to shift right and we also thought we could see more pressure to the left. So we just extended with a starboard pole. And um, when we jibed, we were already quite close to them. And then we were quicker. And eventually, they did a couple of jibes in the middle. Um, and we just crossed, you know, and was just really quiet on the boat. Really quiet. I mean, it still gives me goosebumps, but we, you know, we just sort of slid across about half a length in front of them and and got to the bottom mark and um, quite close to the bottom mark. Did a float drop, no problem, beautiful float drop at the bottom. And um, just a whole bunch of tacks up the last beat, you know, fake tacks, classic old school match racing stuff. Punched way to the right, ended up in the um, spectator fleet. And um, I was the navigator going, Huey, we can, we can lay from here, you know, we can lay. Uh, you know, I'm calling the time to the ley line all the time. We're, we're over ley line in the spectator boat, so there's risk now because we're in those spectator boats. And um, Huey's, <laughs> Huey was just, he would, they, you know, if they were on port, we were on port. And, and eventually we just reached, we eventually gave up and we reached back to the finish. But, uh, yeah, they, I don't, occasionally they catch a bit in the tacks. They were, they were okay tacking. Whereas normally Australia 2 is pretty strong boat tacking quite low wooded surface. But um, yeah, they were, uh, there wasn't much in it all the way up that beat. And then of course, way out to the right in the spectators, back to the finish. And not, it was quite 
um, nobody just, you know, Bertram steered the boat extremely well through all those tacks. Quite difficult boats to tack because they're underpowered. Uh, he was cool. And Huey Trahan, who we don't hear much of anymore, but he was awesome. Yeah, he was really good too. You were a solid team of young guys, you know, yeah. a maverick designer and a backer who really never stopped believing. It was a, a winning combination and you pulled it off. To a 26-year-old Grant Simmer, just beginning really to forge his way in the sport, what did it mean to win it? I mean, did you realise just how momentous a win it actually was? You know, we were quite isolated there as a group and a small team. Like, a, I don't really remember this, but the whole team was like 23 people or 24 people. That was it. That was the whole team. And and we were just, you know, you can imagine us in a little group celebrating. And we'd really, when we heard that the Prime Minister of Australia had essentially called a holiday because we'd won this event... Everybody was just shocked by that, by the magnitude of what that, what we'd done. Yeah, I remember still thinking, wow, he called a holiday? What's that all about? But, um, yeah. And the press conference that night was fantastic. You know, we had the whole, whatever, 23 of us on stage together and Warren spoke. It was fantastic. Warren and Bondi. Yeah. And Dennis at the other end. Yeah, poor old Dennis. I mean, he really sailed well, you know, under. And we, I think we were their match in terms of being a crew. Clearly, we were their match. Um, but yeah, we had better equipment as well. What was it like when you got home? Um, well, we had the. In cups, we talk about this in Cup World, the ticker tape parade. We had the ticker tape parade in, in, uh, in Perth. That was quite a big deal. Big, big thing in Perth. Went to the, went to the national parliament and, you know, the team, they had all this sort of whistle stop thing around Australia that we did. And then, that was it, and I went back to being an engineer. I started working as a consulting engineer again within, I don't know, a month of coming back to Australia with no real plans to do any more sailing. That, I mean, that was, you did the America's Cup, then you went back to your day job sort of thing. That's what it was like in those days. And then um, um, Schnack called me and, uh, and said, look, there's an opportunity to to run North South Australia. Um, uh, we want North want somebody to run North South Australia, which I did with uh, a partner and a really good mate of mine, a guy called Michael Coxon. Coco and I, who didn't really know each other that well at all, knew of each other, but we then ended up kind of buying North South Australia. Uh, and that was the end of 1983. So I stopped being an engineer and started being a guy running a sail loft. Not really a sail maker, but a guy running a sail loft together with Coco, of which then we did that for the next 17 years together as partners. Really good years. And that led to many other America's Cups because we were making sails and Admiral's Cups and Maxis and all the things we did. Famously, the, the boat broke in half and sank. There was a big movement against the Kiwis who jumped ship to go with the Swiss. Why wouldn't you let me in the gate? Because <laughs> I didn't want to show you the boat. As you say, you did go back to the Cup. You were involved with Bondi again for the defence in Perth, but the team lost out in the Defender Trials to Kookaburra. But you came back again with John Bertrand for the 1995 Cup in San Diego. Promoted to design coordinator. Tell the listeners how that one ended. Huh. Yeah, so it's 1995, we're in San Diego. One Australian, big team, big, good team. Um, pretty good. We'd, had, we'd built a couple of boats 
for the version five boats and the second boat we were racing in San Diego in um, with the, our latest boat it was only just arrived in San Diego against Team New Zealand in there they were the really gun boat and we and we hadn't been able to beat them in our original boat 29 and uh, but the new boat was quite a bit better and we were racing it was quite rough and choppy and uh, there was some debate whether we'd race because it was so windy and I'd been arguing we should race so we can find out what would break you know what so we should race and in the new boat we're going to debug it and everything the engineers were a bit nervous and so we raced and um, famously the boat buckled in the shear line and broke in half and sank essentially with all the crew i wasn't a member of the crew in those days but the big big fellow was ian ian john bertrand on board rod davis steering berkey tactician yeah, flipper on the main sheet anyway the bloody you were boat. in the red boat yeah you? yeah pulling him out of the water then because it sank and it sank really fast. I'm sure everyone's seen the video. It was quite a good boat. I don't, it would have never, wouldn't have beaten the Kiwis in their 30, their boat was 32, but uh, would have been a lot closer. <sighs> that was a sad day, yeah. What did you learn from, from that day? <sighs> well, Design is actually, since then, our FEA, the modelling, finite element modelling, has moved on a lot. In those days it was pretty, so 95 was pretty early days for FEA. And we'd build a structure in the boat that was, instead of having a full keel bulkhead, it was, there were just kind of small bulkheads in the boat, small frames really. And, um, yeah, the boat broke just after the keel attachment and, uh, you know, it just wasn't stiff enough longitudinally and uh, and then that created buckling in the top sides and then eventually tore through the hull all the way down. And eventually the thing just folded in half and sunk. Luckily we got the, all the crew off. Um, no one hurt. No one hurt. <laughs> Well, it's a good watch on YouTube if uh, anyone wants to go and have a look. It's, yeah, yeah. It's, but, it's, you know, in there. 2000, it happened to the Americans. They're both same, exactly the same problem. And then in 2003, the Kiwi broke, broke up there too. Well, by 2000, New Zealand had won the cup and then successfully defended the cup uh, but after Auckland, much of the incredibly strong Kiwi team, including Russell Coates and Brad Butterworth, defected, wooed by the ambition and resources of Swiss billionaire Ernesto Bertarelli. They became the force that was a lingi, and Russell wanted you to coordinate the design. I mean, that's a good call to get. How did that come about? <laughs> yeah, that was... Uh... Murray Jones rang me first and then said, would you be interested in doing this? And uh, who I didn't really know the captain that well in those days. And then Russell and it was because I was thinking of, I was very, very close to going with One World uh, with, with Gilly and the, all that, they had quite a good team at One World. And Russell said, uh, would you, we need somebody to manage our design program. We've got lots of good guys, but a little bit disco, you know, uncoordinated. We think you can do this job. Why don't you come up and do it, you know? And, uh, and he said, bring your wife and, and, uh, can you come on? It was like Wednesday or something. Can you come on Friday? You know, bring your wife. I'll, I'll send you a business, you know, business class tickets. Off you get, come on. So I said, okay, and, and then we met Ernesto for the first time, went to a fancy restaurant with Ernesto and, you know, stayed in a five-star hotel. They really, really laid it on. Uh, and I always laughed because when we eventually signed up, we were then in Lausanne in a hotel next to the railway station. <laughs> but... Um, 
Yeah, and so I decided to go with them, mainly because I was really fascinated by Russell and Brad and Murray and that Warwick, Dino, that team, Simon, the guys that had that had been on, um, you know, the Kiwi Team New Zealand, they were really strong. Yeah. So I was really keen to do it. I didn't know Rolfie Vrolic or Dirk Kramers or all the guys that we then work with in the design team. Turned out to be a really strong design team. Um, yeah, no regrets really. That was fantastic. To, oh, and Jochen was there. So it was really fun to, to be with those guys um, and just see, particularly see Russell operating. He was he was really a force in those days. And uh, how to manage a team properly. He, I learned a lot from Russell and, and Brad strategically was really, kept, really clever. And you see the way they sell, you know, when they were, when they were in their heyday, like that 03 cup, pretty, pretty impressive how well they sell. And we ended up, you know, we ended up with a good boat. 64, that boat was, um, really good boat, but they were, they were really at the top of their game. And it was when we got to New Zealand, that was the Blackheart thing, I don't know, do you know about that? Yeah. It was pretty ugly in New Zealand. There was a, there was a big movement against the Kiwis who jumped ship to go with the, with the Swiss. And, uh, and, uh, so there was this loyal campaign, really targeting. It was quite ugly, actually. And in a way, it made our team stronger because be, before we went to New Zealand, it was a bit like the the Kiwis and the, the, all the other nationalities, but the Kiwis were kind of gods. And then when it went to New Zealand and it was suddenly... Um, they were really under attack, really a lot of pressure on them, particularly Russell and Brad, particularly. Um, we all had to sort of merge to support them and get around them and be strong as a team. Um, and in a way, I think it made us even a stronger unit. Nesto, of course, was cool, just a really cool guy and great guy to work with. And in the, in the sailing crew, so very, very involved in the whole thing. We talked to Russell on the podcast, uh, you know, about that cup. And he talks about, you know, every day going out to race, being, being taunted, being yelled at by the, by the Kiwi fans. And I mean, he, he talks about, he said it was a motivator in a way. He was sort of channeling that energy into the race course. Uh, Tough uh. though. He probably won't like me talking about, it, but I, I've never seen anybody so focused. You know, when we went out the first race, like you could barely talk to him. He was just so focused. So I've never seen anybody so uh, intense. Not not in a bad way, just incredibly intense. You know, ready, ready to take it on. And they were, as I, you know, as I said earlier. Dino making the line calls, I don't know if you ever watched those starts, but okay, we had pre-start programs and that. But the judgment and the, the judgment, you know, Murray calling the strategy, Brad just, you know, Russell would just listen to Brad and, you know, Brad would call the shots. A bloody strong, strong unit, really strong. Well, Lingi didn't just win that cup, they smashed the proud Kiwis 5-0. They won every match. Yeah, the Kiwis had some grief for their boat, which would have been difficult for them to deal with. You know, they had breakages. A pretty good boat, hey? That was a, the Kiwi boat was pretty fast, had the hula on it, so which was kind of a way of making, adding volume in the end and making the boat effectively longer, which was a glitch in the rule which cleverly, Schnack again, Schnack had sort of come up with this, I think it was Schnack had come up with this idea. And we were in the background putting pressure on the measurers about how they were going to measure it and eventually we were able to reduce the advantage. But the boats were quite equal. You know, our boat being 
more conventional, really good boat, but the Kiwi boat with the hula on was probably a stronger all-round boat. But they had some breakages and it would have been hard for them really to operate with so many things going wrong. After 2003, Coots left Alinghi and yeah. you were promoted to CEO. I mean, how different a role was that for you? I mean, oh, Russell, we've spoke about, you know, he's a, a great talent and a real force in any organisation. He must have left a, a massive hole. Yeah, yeah, it was really hard, um, really hard. And it was difficult because I'd owed a lot to, to Russell because he'd, you know, hired me in the first place. And it was hard for all his mates too that were still with Alinghi and Russell had gone. Um, yeah, it was not a great era for anybody involved. Very difficult for the team to recover. So Brad and I worked together really a lot. Um, Brad was kind of the leader of the team together with Ernesto and I was the guy doing, doing a lot of work. That's how Brad and I had it organised. And, and um, yeah, and then we, we had Ed and Pete Holmberg as our two helmsmen. And we really went through a difficult period after Russell left, but we gradually got it together. And um, we went to Dubai in um, the Christmas of uh, 06, beginning of 07, and we did a training camp there with our two boats. And I really, that helped the team get together. We got sort of got everyone away together in a unit and did a good camp there. And um, I think we got a lot stronger. And the cup was another tight cup, racing the Kiwis, like really tight. Um, which again had that incredible race with Alinghi winning by a second with a big shift right at the end and uh, broken spinnaker poles and, uh, you know, carnage. And the Kiwis had to do a penalty on the finishing line and the uh, Alinghi just crossed ahead of them. It was a great cup to watch. Yeah, I, yeah. I mean, I knew. Some it, great racing. Fab racing, and you successfully defended, you know, that cup in 2007. What was that like to be the boss, to reshape the whole campaign and succeed? Well, I was, re I was just really proud of the team, actually. I mean, I I'd say, you know, Brad was kind of the leader, but Brad is not a big worker. <laughs> Brad's more of the... Brad's kind of the cool guy with a, you know, he's a good leader because he thinks clearly and strategically. And so I was the guy, as I said, doing the work and it was sort of gratifying that we finally got there. And of course, Ernesto just holding it all together through all of that. Um, I was involved. Bloody good was guy, he? Ernesto. Oh yeah, involved every day. Involved in all the decisions. Supportive, but involved in all the decisions. I really enjoyed working for Ernesto, yeah. Well, after Edingi defended the cup, things all got very acrimonious. The lawyers got involved and months in court eventually led to a deed of gift match in Valencia in the winter. I mean, a crazy time. Designing and building a giant multi-hull with very little limits in a short space of time. I don't know if you remember this, but I remember coming to an industrial estate at the wrong end of Lake Geneva, where the boat was in build a while before the match. We wanted to interview you and you wouldn't let us through the gate. We I, interviewed you. I do you. remember. Do you remember? I that? do remember. Yeah. We interviewed in you. In Villeneuve, yeah. That's right, through a wire security fence. The only time I've had to do that. Uh, How stressed was Grant Simmer back then? Yeah, it wasn't a great. We had the core of the team still. Um, but it wasn't even, I mean, Ernesto was excited about the boat and everything, but it wasn't what we wanted to do. We were just forced into this thing. It wasn't like we wanted to be there. So that it wasn't a comfortable time for any of us. I mean, okay, we we're building this big cool boat and particularly Dirk Kramers, he was really loving it, you know, 
really loving it because it was a boat that he'd always wanted to build and it was really about engineering those boats. But, you know, we built it, we rented, or we rented this big factory where we built the hulls and the masts and the boards and the beams. And then we, where you were talking to me in Villeneuve, we built a big tent and it was a construction, it was where we were going to assemble the boat. And um, Silvio was our ops manager, Silvio Riverbeni, and um, the boat, we then assembled the boat and it went upside down under these big blocks of concrete that were cast into the ground so that we could structurally test the boat. Just, uh, you know, massive loads, massive loads, massive riding moments. So we started off with saying, and it was Dirk who said this, which I... He was right, but he said, look, we've got to limit the writing moment or else we don't know what we're going to build. You know, we've got to start by saying, okay, this is the writing moment. So we said, okay, we'll make it 200 ton metres, the writing moment, which is a ridiculous number. We ended up at 220 or 230 like most boats, but the Americans had more. So while the boat was upside down, we put all these loads into the boat structurally tested it really to a nice good level which we've just done downstairs here with this uh, with this our second boat here which is a nice way when you're building a radical boat to uh, get some confidence in the boat so the boat was well engineered um yeah yeah they were difficult times why wouldn't you let me in the gate <laughs> because i didn't want to show you the boat it was quite a nice looking boat, I might say. <laughs> it added to the drama. It was, yeah. it was, it was fine. I mean, the event, Grant, was crazy too. You know, Oracle turned up with a wing. They had to essentially sail all night. I mean, did you know then that it was going to be impossible? I mean, Ernesto also, he chose to, to drive the boat himself. And the whole atmosphere felt, I mean, it felt really toxic. Exciting to cover, but nevertheless, you know, all a bit unpleasant. It was, yeah, it was horrible. The whole measurement process was horrible. There wasn't any... I mean, we were dealing with the deed of gift, which was about a page and a half document, which couldn't have foreseen anything like this. No, it was um, unfortunate. Interesting, well, the Americans built a wing sail, which then had, you know, we used in the next two cups and... To great benefit. Interestingly, John Marshall called me. John Marshall, who was president, had been a previous president of North South and was the main chief trimmer on, on Liberty in 83. Really good guy. And he said, and he built the wing. He was the design coordinator in 88 when the catamaran raced the big Kiwi boat and it had a wing sail. And he rang, we were still, we hadn't assembled the boat yet. We had a whole bunch of problems building boards and things. And he rang and said, the Americans are going to build a wing sail and you're not going to be able to beat it. So you have to do it. And um, we were already really stretched with resources. So we discussed it, you know, with Ernesto and Brad and I and, and um, we decided we couldn't do it. That was a fatal error, really. And it would have cost Ernesto a huge amount of money. We would have had to buy more engineers. And I think he kind of was topping out. It wasn't all about the money, but it was just this thing is kind of getting out of control. And clearly, I think our boat will wing sail, you know, would have made the difference. They were, they were a lot faster downwind than a Lingi 5. So just being able to power up more downwind, they were, they were a lot faster than us downwind. So, um, yeah, I think, I think it would have been a good thing to do. But did we have time? We kept having trouble building boards and we were trying to build curve boards. In fact, Dan Bernasconi worked for us. 
and was designing the boards and we but we he wasn't designing the structure and we had problem with the structure of the boards and our build methods and that really consumed a lot of energy um, so if we'd build a wing mast you know our sails were nice but not not with the same level of control as you could have with a wing sail and that really was that and the fact that the the Americans had more, a little bit more riding moment than us was probably a deciding factor. We're wrapping up part one with Grant after that unsuccessful deed of gift defence back in 2010. His team, Alinghi, losing out to Larry Ellison's BMW Oracle Racing, a result that took the Cup back to the US and teed up AC34, the San Francisco Cup, a much talked about affair on this podcast. So do join us for part two, because Grant was an integral part of that winning US team and has some great inside stories on how that remarkable turnaround went down. As ever, please let me know what you think about the podcast at Shirley Sale on Instagram and Twitter, just me on Facebook. And please try to like, review and subscribe on whatever platform you're joining us on. It'd be great to know your thoughts on Grant and to know how you've enjoyed any of the other podcasts we've been making. As ever, this podcast has been lovingly brought to you by the dedication of Tim at Vertigo Films. Big thanks as ever to Tim. You're a star. Until next time, thank you so much for listening and sail safe, everyone. This is Castle Watson, Race Officer speaking. Pressure coming here, pressure coming. With 1.5 below. Two guys here, boys. We're looking at 10 fives and 42. Fives and 42. This is Castle One standing by. Out. Oh.